today we are going to continue our discussion on uh, heat transfer using the technique of shell balance but today we're going to go into a, a kind of a more complicated system which now deals not just with uh, uh, thermal conduction but also convection. So we're going to look at forced and free convection heat transfer. So let's take a look at uh, the two scenarios separately. So first, let's kind of briefly show you the um, important aspects in forced and free convection separately. So let's start with forced convection. So for forced convection heat transfer, the first important aspect is that the flow patterns are predetermined or are determined primarily by some external forces. So that's the first thing is that, or in other words, that means that the flow pattern is not going to be affected by the temperature gradient, okay? So flow patterns are determined primarily by some external forces like pressure gradient, for example. External forces. So that's the first one. Okay, so to deal with uh, force convection heat transfer problem, the first step would be what? The first step would be find the velocity profile. So one is find velocity profile using your knowledge in fluid mechanics and two we're going to use the found velocity profile to find the temperature profile so use oops sorry use as USC use found velocity profile to find the temperature profile to find the temperature profile and then uh, the third would be uh, just some information is that the Nussle number here which we'll use a lot for the uh, convective heat transport the Nussle number depends on the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. And for the second procedure, usually uh, we would use that procedure for fluids with constant physical properties. Meaning that we will assume that the physical properties like uh, viscosity is not severely or significantly affected by the temperature. So usual procedure for fluids with constant physical property. Okay, so that's the case for forced convection heat transfer. Okay, so the essence here first is that for forced convection, we will assume that the flow patterns or like the velocity profile is not really affected by the temperature gradient. And it's gonna be determined by like some external forces like pressure gradient, okay? So you'll find the velocity profile that's gonna be using your flow mechanics under some, some some conditions but not affected by temperature profile and you'll use that velocity profile and to find the temperature profile because you'll now have a term that's going to be uh, governed by convection and finally in this case the Nussle number will depend on the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number okay now let's take a look at what's going to happen if it's a free convection heat transfer problem so we're going to scroll this up a bit and we're going to look at free convection. So let's say free 
convection heat transfer. So for free convection heat transfer, the flow pattern is now determined by the buoyant force. So the first important aspect here is that the flow pattern is determined by buoyant force on the heated fluid. Okay, and second is the velocity and temperature profiles are now interdependent. So velocity and temperature profile are interdependent, meaning that they depend on each other. And finally, for free convection problems, the nut salt number and U depends on what? Not on the Reynolds anymore because the velocity component is now not as important. So it depends on the Grashof number, which we will introduce later. The Grashof, I think it's using GR, if I remember this correctly, and the Prandtl number. Okay, so that kind of qualitatively uh, illustrates um, the, the key aspects for forced and free convection heat transfer. So the essence here is that um, whether the velocity profile is affected by the temperature profile. For forced convection, we would assume that the velocity profile is independent of the temperature profile, while in free convection, the motion here is actually, the fluid motion is actually driven by the buoyant forces, meaning that there's going to be some density difference that's driving the motion of the fluid. And typically, uh, we know that uh, a, a very easy way for uh, density to be different is at different temperatures. Okay, so un under the absence of some strong external forces, then you might have a case for free convection heat transfer. Okay, so let me take a break and, uh, you know, get a sip of uh, coffee. <sighs> okay, so with that said, let's come into some example, okay? So let's first look at forced convection in a circular tube, something that chemical engineers you will encounter almost in daily lives. Okay, so the first example would be forced convection, forced convection in circular tube. Okay, so basically we're looking at an example looking at heating of a laminar fluid. Heating of a fluid in laminar flow. Okay, so let's draw a quick schematic on what that is. So let's say you have a cylindrical tube that looks like that. Not a good drawer, maybe I can draw this better. 
Okay, and let's define the coordinates. So typically for cylinders or cylindrical coordinates, we have uh, two dimensions or three dimensions, but typically we only look at the two dimensions. So the R direction and the radius and the Z direction and the axial direction. And let's say we know that this is defined as Z equals to zero. And so we have a temperature of T naught at this entrance. The fluid is coming in from above, downwards, and going out. Okay, and then we assume that, you know, you have some heating coils, you know, some heating coils surrounding our cylindrical tube so that you have a constant heat flow coming in from the radial direction. Okay, so we assume that we have a constant heat flow Q not uh, into the tube wall. Into the tube wall. Okay. So basically, you can see that the T naught and the Q naught is basically defining uh, the boundary conditions here. So as mentioned here, this is a force convection problem, and um, it's going to be um, a fluid motion driven by pressure gradient. Okay, it's not a plug flow. So if it's not a plug flow, then the first thing we want to do is, again, remember the first step, is to find the velocity profile. So find velocity profile. And this can also be done by performing shell momentum balance. Okay, and we know that for this flow in the Z direction, the velocity in the radial direction and in the theta directions are going to be zero. So the key here is how can you find the velocity profile in the Z direction? Okay, and um, I'm not going to go over how this is done. I would anticipate you can, you know, figure this out by yourself. So I'm just going to show you the results. So basically, it's going to be pressure driven uh, laminar flow. So you have a P naught minus some PL over four mu L times R square, which is the radius of the tube. And uh, you have one minus r over r square and typically we just write this as some v maximum which is at the center of the tube times what times one minus r over r square okay and this is valid provided that the entrance length is well exceeded provided that entrance length has been exceeded. Okay, so provide, let's say we already show you or given you the velocity profile, but in principle, you will have to be able to to solve for the velocity profile ourselves. But uh, for the sake of, of this class today, we're not going to focus on that. We're gonna focus on how you, you know, figure out the heat transfer here, okay? So let's try to find our second part here, is heat transport, okay? And the first question we wanna ask ourselves again is,
we want to do a shell balance here and how should we define our shell now so before we define that we need to think of how the heat is going to flow right so we have heat coming uh, into the tube from the wall from the side so you obviously will have heat transfer in the R direction but you also have fluid coming from the top to the bottom which also will carry heat right so that means you will also have heat transfer in the z direction so in order to construct a shell that shell must be taken both heat transfer in both directions into account okay so that means what that means that the shell balance here uh, must be able to be transformed into a differential equation in both directions okay so that means when delta z or delta r becomes infinitely small then you have a differential equation for both directions and how do you get that the way to get that is by drawing a shell that looks like this right so if you want to have a delta z and delta r so for delta z, it will be simple, right? For delta z, you can think of something as a, you know, a thin disk. A thin disk that has delta z here. Delta z. But you also want to have delta r. So that means instead of having a thin disk, you actually want what? You actually want to have a small washer type shell. So you have also delta R here. So this is called a uh, washer type washer type uh, you know shell. And the key for that is you will have both. delta r and delta z because you would expect heat transfer in both directions okay so now let's try to perform the shell balance so let's try to perform that shell balance now okay so basically we need to do shell balance in the combine of r and z direction Okay, so first let's take a look at the R direction. R direction. All we have is well, we have the combined energy flux vector in the R direction at R times the cross sectional area, which is 2 pi R times delta Z minus what's going out so r r plus delta r 2 pi r delta z that's the r direction and then let's take a look at the z direction what we have here is again the combined energy flux vector in the z direction times the uh, cross-sectional area, which is 2 pi r delta r minus e z at z plus delta z 2 pi r delta r. Okay, so these are the combined uh, energy flux vector, but also we have an additional term here that's not uh, covered by the combined energy flux vector, which is the work done on a fluid by gravity. So we're going to add that in here. So we have to add that part. So that's going to be rho vz times g times 2 pi r delta r delta z. So basically that's gravity, right? So the volume of the shell times its density times its velocity would be gravitational force, okay? Or that would be the potential energy or maybe the kinetic energy too. And that equals to zero. And let's 
make a note here. This is the work. This is the work done on the fluid by gravity. Okay, so you have your shell balance uh, constructed here. And the next step is, uh, you know, very standard, like textbook example. We are going to divide the whole equation by two pi r delta, uh, sorry, by two pi delta r and delta z. So we are going to divide by two pi delta r and delta z. Okay, and we cannot divide by r because r is a change, changing variable. Can't divide all by r because r is a changing variable. Okay, and if you do that, what you get is the following. So we're gonna divide everything by two pi delta r delta z. So let's cross all that out, two pi delta r delta z. So we're gonna divide this by delta r. You're gonna divide that by delta z. Okay, so what you have is the following, you get for the r direction, we have d, dr, maybe you put a negative here, uh, the combined energy flux vector times r in the er direction minus d, dz, z, uh, not sorry, still r, r, e sub z, equals to what? Equals to. I think we're missing a minus sign here. Equals to negative rho vz g times r. Okay, so if we take off the minus sign, we get D D R R E R plus D D Z R E Z equals to rho V Z G R. Okay, so this would be our differential equation, right? So differential equation. Now, as we did for previous examples, our next step would be to analyze the combined energy flux vector and you know look at the terms analyze the terms which terms are zero and which terms are not so let's do that so i would say analyze analyze the combined energy flux vectors so we have what we have e sub r equals to what we we're going to expand everything so first is the convective part so one half rho v square plus rho u bar, or we'll just use h. The more convenient term times v r plus the shear stress in the r direction plus the shear stress in the z direction plus the shear stress in the theta direction plus heat transfer or heat conduction in the R direction. So if you look at the terms here, there is no R component velocity. So we'll take that as zero. Take the, and there is also no theta component velocity. We'll also take that as zero. So finally, you're left with two terms. One is the shear stress or work done on a fluid in the Z direction and also the thermal conduction in the R direction. So where you have heat coming in, right? So that's that. So if we uh, further analyze that, that would become negative mu partial VZ 
partial r times vz minus k times the thermal part k times partial t partial r. That's the combined energy flux vector simplified finally. And then let's look at the combined energy flux vector in the z direction. Again, we can have one half rho v square plus rho h v z <coughs> plus rho z z v z plus rho z r v r plus tau And then we have tau z theta and v theta. Okay, um, so that's the, the, the work done by shear forces. And then also we would have, uh, you know, thermal conduction in z direction. So let's analyze all that together. So again, we are going to see which terms are, you know, non-existing, so obviously there's no velocity in the r and theta direction, so these two terms disappear. And uh, let's try to expand the convection term here and see what happens later on. So if we expand the convection term, we have one half rho v square times vz. And then if we separate the enthalpy term to you know, some standard enthalpy terms, so H naught would be a scholar, plus the pressure differential term, so P minus P naught VZ, plus a temperature term, so rho C P T minus T reference VZ, and then you still have uh, the work associated term, so we have minus 2 mu partial vz partial z times vz minus the thermal conductivity times partial t partial z. Again, we know that the velocity in a z a direction is not a function of z, so this vanishes again. And so you can see that uh, what's happening here is we can look at also two terms in the convection part. So the kinetic energy and the standard enthalpy as some reference state, let's give it a symbol alpha. So the alpha terms here, the alpha terms here does not, does not vary with z. Okay, so the terms will vanish after taking the derivative of z because what? Because vz is also not changing with z. So after you do, after you plug these into the differential equation. So these two terms change to zero too. So I should say after taking derivative. Sorry, derivative. Derivative. So finally, we're going to be dealing with this term, this term, and this term. Okay. So now let's substitute these analyzed um, combined energy flux vector back into our differential equation. What do we have now? All right, so uh, our differential equation is up here, up here. And let's plug all these terms uh, back into the differential equation, right? So if we do that, we see that d, dr times R E R equals to D D R R times negative mu partial V Z 
partial r times vz minus r times the thermal conductivity partial t partial r and we have d dz r ez now equals to d dz r times rho cp t minus t naught vz plus uh, r times p minus p naught vz minus r times k partial t partial z okay so next let's do some uh, rearrangement into the initial uh, equation so we'll say after rearrangement we have the following we have rho cp vz partial t partial z now equals to the thermal conductivity times 1 over r partial t partial r plus partial square t partial r square plus k partial square t partial z square plus mu times partial vz partial r square plus vz times negative partial p partial z plus mu over r partial vz partial r plus mu partial square vz partial r square plus rho g okay Okay, and if you look at the terms in the bracket at the bottom here, this is exactly the shell balance for momentum at steady state. So this is the shell balance for momentum. at not half at steady state what that means is that the whole term here equals to zero okay so finally 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 so eventually we are solving we are solving rho cp vz partial t partial z equals to k times 1 over r partial partial r r partial t partial r plus partial square t partial r square plus mu partial vz partial r square okay so everything now looks very simple right so you have a convective term right here on the left hand side you have the thermal conductivity term which is the conduction term and you have the work associated to fluid motion and typically typically um, we for force convection problems we typically will neglect this term 
neglect for forced convection problem. Because if it's not really dramatic and it's already taking a, a square, okay, so it's not going to affect much, right? And if that's the case, if that's not going to affect much, uh, so I'll say that if neglecting the viscous term uh, and used and use the velocity profile solved previously what we have is the following we have rho cp vz max times 1 minus r over r square times partial t partial z equals to k times 1 over r partial partial r times r partial t partial r sorry this should be z squared Okay, so we want to solve this with the boundary conditions. So boundary conditions, we have R e at when R equals to zero, the temperature should be finite. And when R equals to R, we know that the thermal conduction part should equals to Q naught. the constant and when z equals to zero the temperature should be the entrance temperature okay so uh, let's take a small break and we'll come back later okay so um, sorry I've been jumping a little bit ahead of myself so also you can see that we are neglecting the heat conduction in the z direction because we know from experience the heat direction is z uh, the heat conduction in the z direction is typically much smaller than convection so we'll say that neglect typically much smaller than convection Okay, so coming back to solving our final equation, you can see that this is a partial differential equation having two variables, uh, z and r. Okay, so how do we uh, solve this? The question is, how do we, how do we solve this? And the answer is, the strategy would be trying to put the problem statement into dimensionless form. So strategy. We want to put problem statement into dimensionless form. It's, a, it's kind of a way of doing the combination of variables. But let's see how this is going to be perceived. So first, let's define the dimensionless temperature. Okay, it's defined as the symbol capital theta equals to T minus the entrance temperature over Q naught div times R divided by the thermal conductivity. Okay. And this is actually suggested 
suggested by the second and third boundary conditions. Okay, now let's define the dimensionless radius. We have this weird symbol here defined as r over the whole radius. And this would be our natural selection. And finally, we have the dimensionless z. Which we use the symbol right here equals to z over rho cp v max r square over k. Okay, so basically this is getting rid of remaining constants. Okay, so why are we doing this? What is the objective? The objective here of doing the dimensionless form is to minimize the number of parameters. Minimize number of parameters in the final problem statement. Okay, so if we do that, okay, what happens is the following. So after defining dimensionless groups, we will have to transform everything into dimensionless characters. So if you look at the temperature one here, partial T, partial Z now equals to Q naught R over K partial theta partial zeta partial z and also we want to transfer the z into dimensionless group so q naught r over k times partial theta partial zeta times partial zeta partial z equals to what equals to q naught r times k multiply by k times rho cp v max r square partial theta partial uh, zeta okay so if you cancel these out this equals to this a very complicated uh, combination of different constants, but you'll see what, what, what this lead us to, okay? So R also cancels out. Partial theta, partial zeta. Okay, so the first term on the left-hand side now becomes what? Becomes rho cp v max times 1 minus r over r square times partial t partial z this now equals to what equals to q naught over r times 1 minus this dimensionless r square times partial theta partial zeta Okay, so doing the same tricks on the right-hand side, we have the following. We have partial T partial R equals to Q naught over, well, let's write this clear, Q naught over K times partial theta partial dimensionless R. And also we have the other term, which is the second derivative. So we have 
uh, where is it? With the partial partial r times r partial t partial r now equals to one over r partial partial id r q naught times k partial theta first dimension is r okay so so finally the equation becomes just showing you the result. I'm sure you can figure this out by yourself later again. So equation becomes Q naught over capital R times one minus dimension is R square partial capital theta partial zeta equals to Q naught over R times one over dimension is R partial partial dimension is R times theta partial theta partial dimension is R. Okay, you can see that variables now cancels out. So you're left with the final equation one minus Dimension is R square partial capital theta partial zeta equals to one over dimension is R partial partial dimension is R times dimension is R times partial theta partial dimension is R. Okay. And you have the boundary conditions being at the dimensions R equals to zero. Your dimensionless temperature is finite. And at dimensions R equals to one, partial dimensions temperature to dimensions R equals to one. And when zeta, which is Z equals to zero, we have the dimension temperature equals to zero. Okay, so this becomes a relatively easier uh, differential equation or PDE and the complete solution can be solved by the separation of variables. because you have finite boundaries between zero and one, you have Z only at zero, okay? And you can use separation variables to solve for this. And you're gonna be using Fourier series solutions because you have rather very simple conditions for the boundary conditions, okay? Okay, so we are going to uh, and our first example, or our example for forced convection here, we'll take a short break and we'll come back with our other example.